Welcome to the Writer Talent Search at Thought Bubble 2021 in association with 2000 AD. I am your host, Molchar, the publicity droid for the galaxy's greatest comic. And I am joined by uh, two writers and uh, one graphic novel editor. Uh, uh, have you ever written, Oliver? Yeah, but you'll never read it. Three, three, <laughs> three writers then. <laughs> uh, who are going to be judging this year's uh, submitted finalists, and they are Maura McHugh, uh, Ram V, and uh, Oliver Pickles. Excellent. Now, for those who haven't seen uh, last year's panel, because of the pandemic, we took what had been an in-person uh, panel at Thought Bubble and moved it online. So ordinarily, we would get uh, people to form a queue and then uh, on a first come, first go basis, they would have two minutes to pitch an idea for a future shock, which is the, the very long standing uh, story format uh, from 2000 AD, which is a, uh, between four and six pages. It's currently four. One self-contained story with a sting in the tail. It sounds easy. It's one of the hardest tasks in comics to get right. Writers like uh, Peter Milligan, Alan Moore, Mark Miller, John Smith. These are, these are writers who honed their skills writing uh, Future Shocks for 2000 AD. So um, we took the panel and took it online and got people to submit their pictures in video. Now, last year, it worked really well. So we're doing the same this year. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be able to have this esteemed panel uh, to go through the five entries that we have for this year. So it's a case of, uh, we're going to share the screen on Zoom. We're going to listen uh, to the pitch. Um, hopefully the sound comes through okay. And then uh, we'll go through the panel and they'll all decide you know, what they liked, what they didn't like, and the advice they might have for the uh for for the writer and uh, at the end it's you three who have to actually pick the winner mm. it's been quite a process of oh. sifting through these um we had uh i think it was over a hundred and i think we had 107 entries excellent um which uh, uh is is an all-time high so you know Great. Thank you to everybody who, 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 uh, who put in their, um, uh, their pitches. So, uh, Maury, uh, looking back on, on last year, um, what was your overriding um, uh, feeling uh, about, uh, about the pitches that we, that we had? Well, first off, I, th I always think how brave people are to do this, actually, because not only are you putting together a written pitch, you're also sending a video pitch, which is really difficult and actually not really what writers often do uh, to certainly the video part. So um, I commend all of them for the bravery of doing that and putting yourself forward. I mean, we all um, have rejection when we're writers. All of us have had it. So, uh, you know, of the hundred and, you know, plus people who submitted, you know, we're bringing it down to, what is it, five? So that that's, you know, that's a lot of disappointed people. I would just say keep writing. <laughs> but main thing is you're looking for a full story. And because it's future shocks, something with perhaps hopefully a bit of a twist or a turn uh, and with interesting characters and something oh, I actually really like if it's fun, <laughs> not some, you know, dour. There's a lot of sort of very serious stuff. So and, and variety and inventiveness, you know, simple stuff to get into four pages. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, Ram, I mean, this is this is your first time on the panel. Yeah. Um, future shocks. I, I know I've I've seen um, uh, particularly writers who've come up to uh, American comics mm. and have twenty two pages a month mm. uh, to play with. Um, when when they first hear about future shocks, their their jaws drop and they kind of go a bit white and sweaty at the yeah. at the idea of, of compressing a story like this. Right. Um, what what what's What's your feelings about the, the Future Shock as a format? I think it's great. Um, and I think, frankly, if you don't know how to compress story, then then you're, you're missing, you know, some tools in your toolbox. Um, I think the the era of decompressed storytelling is certainly predominant today in, in American comics. But, um, you know, at least my work, um, you know, is generally known for... You're like, oh, I read 20 pages, but 
it feels like I've read way more story than that in, in, in the span of 20 pages. And part of that is visual compression, part of that is narrative compression. And so if you, if you don't know how to do that, then you're, you're certainly missing part of the narrative toolkit. Um, and, and I think future shocks, short stories, even thinking of, I mean, I generally tend to think of my scenes as four page stories, uh, even within a 20 page, 22 page book. Um, and so I think reading and trying to write my own future shots at home uh, was certainly a, an important part of the exercise. So I'm quite excited to see what people have come up with. Well, I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, did you ever uh, try to picture a future shock through the open submissions? No, no, I didn't. Um, partly, partly because I think the first year I considered doing that is when like the pitching process moved into uh, the thought bubbles kind of big festival right. you come in and pitch here. And uh, as, as Maura was saying before, like, I'm not brave enough to pitch anything on video. So if you're, if you're, if you're not looking at my, if you're not looking at my, uh, you know, one page 500 word pitch, uh, then, you know, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, Oliver, uh, you're a graphic novel editor at Rebellion. Um, when uh, when we think back to the classic future shocks, you know the the the, the Alan Moores, the Pete Milligans, the John Smiths, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, sometimes it it can it can feel like they're this they're so perfect, they're so nicely done. But of course, it, this this is a, a a a rite of passage for a lot of writers, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think something uh, you have to remember is that not every future shock Alan Moore wrote was chronocops. He only wrote one chronocops. <laughs> Uh, and, and future shocks were in so many progs, and many of them are good, but they're not perfect. Um, I, I remember Al Ewing saying in, in an interview when he was starting writing that um, he couldn't imagine himself writing Watchmen, but he, he could imagine himself writing a bad Alan Moore future shock. And I, if you're starting that off, that that's what you're aiming for. You know, you want to, you know, at least try and write a four page story that builds each page builds on the last page um ending in a, a quirky twist that is that, as morris says a, has a sense of humor a sense of fun that keeps you interested um yeah so without much further ado we're uh, gonna crack on and go to our first entry which is uh honor vincent Hello, my name is Honor Vincent, and this is my entry for the 2000 AD Thought Bubble Future Shocks Pitch Competition. Steven, or a subject ST-EV4, is a mouse who was part of a senolytics experiment which made him immortal and left him the only mammalian survivor of the fall of human civilization and all of the destruction that came with it. In Steven's first few centuries alive, he grew in intelligence and developed the ability to read, compose music, do advanced math, and idolize the humans who created him. By the time we catch up with him, he's been kicking around on Earth for over a thousand years and has realized that what he most needs he can never have, someone on his level to talk to. We first see Steven scurrying through a verdant, almost Jurassic world that's packed with insects and reptiles and pocked with the barren ruins of cities. He's equipped with a little helmet and a tiny bag, and as he runs through the first page and a half, he fills us in on how he was created, what happened to Earth, and tells us that he's finally nearing the end of his loneliness. He enters an ancient repair shop deep underground where he hopes to find a cache of old computers. As he enters, a massive fanged grub attempts to grab Stephen and carry him off, but he hits it with a poisoned dart and it melts into the ground. Stephen finds the part he's been looking for in the cache and he shares in narration that this is the last thing he needs to finish his time machine and prevent the disastrous end of the world. He slots the part into the time machine in his home, steps in and steps out into a hole in the wall of his old lab a thousand years prior. Up to this point, he had planned to save the world by telling the humans what would happen so they could prevent it. But seeing the state of the lab and his compatriots, Stephen understands the harm humans have done to him, and instead he poison darts one of the scientists and extends the experimental treatment that created him to the rest of the mice, creating a large family of immortal brethren. We skip forward a year for the last scene as Stephen teaches the mice to count in their underground bunker, nuclear weapons fly, and the earth ends anew. Now, a time travel story, always tricky, 
yeah. uh, to get right with uh, so many uh, excellent examples in the past. We'll start off with Mora. What, what, what's your feelings on uh, on Honor's pitch? Oh my God. I mean, you know, mice with intelligence. It's a good old trope. And it's like animals with intelligence. I'm already there. Methuselah mouse. <laughs> We're starting with at the very beginning. So actually, I think this is an excellent pitch. Really well. Um, uh, even a very small description of what the mouse looks like, you know, what's going to happen. And uh, the turn of, yeah, I mean, there's things that could be finessed here, but really, the broad strokes are fantastic. Nice character, bit of action, uh, time travel surprise at the end. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I just, I, I really want to see this mouse. I mean, whatever happens, she has to get this done. <laughs> Brilliant, lovely. Ram, what's your feelings on the uh, on the story? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it, it works. Uh, it has a good structure that she's working with, so it shows an understanding of like. Why is it a story and not just an idea? Um, and yeah, it's, it's reflective. It comes full circle. Um, I guess if, if I were being critical, the only, the only thing I would look at is um, why, do we, why do we care right at the beginning? But, but that's easy. That's easy to finesse. That's easy to uh, sort of drop in, into that first page, if you will. Um, but yeah, otherwise, otherwise a very strong uh, contender, I would say. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do like the way that there's that, that, that moment when, when he travels back in time and uh, it's kind of, well, obviously this lab is a, is a charnel house of uh, my, I mean, it's just kind of glossed over. Like we, we know what's there. We don't need to go into yeah, the, uh, yeah. the nitty gritty of this. Um, Oliver, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I, I thought it was a good, good concept. My, my notes would be that uh, if you're looking at four pages, um, the, there is a lot, but that's that's the nature of having a quite a densely plotted time travel story. There's a bit in the middle where uh, that the goes into a, a underground um, computer cache, and then a grub attacks a uh, attacks Stephen and, and shoots uh, shoots it with the poison dart. The poison dart comes back later on, so I can understand why that was introduced. But in that, that, I mean, arguably, that's that's like the bit. That I, I would I would take out just because there's no need for that poison grub to attack other than just to reveal that poison darts are involved in the conclusion. It's like a Chekhov's poison dart. <laughs> <laughs> I did um, I did wonder whether um, uh, the yeah. the grub was going to turn out to have been what's left of humanity. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's another thing. Like the, nice, you know, if if you wanted to develop that grub, um, but yeah, I think that that is probably the element. I would remove to condense just slightly. Uh, well, I mean, you could introduce a lot more action in that in that page and a half that's setting up his loneliness and being in this crazy world. And the poison dart could actually be introduced there of fending off all these other yeah. creatures. Yeah. I like the idea that he had venerated the humans, even though they had made him this mutant mouse. And then on returning, it's like, whoa, hang on. <laughs> yeah, and I would almost even think, you know, establishing the fact that he's trying to build a time machine should happen right yeah. at the beginning. Because yeah. then, then it gives you a reason to care. Okay, this yeah. is what he's trying to do, and these are this is him trying to achieve his yeah. need or desire, if you will. Um, so yeah, so I think I think there are certainly a, a few rough edges that can be smoothed out, but in general, I think it works quite well. Yeah, there's good bones, you see. You know, I I like that uh, at the end. It seems like Stephen only really cares about the mice, saving the yeah. mice from the nuclear uh, holocaust. He doesn't care about the humans really. Yeah. Do mice need saving from nuclear holocaust? I imagine they'll just survive anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it's the cockroaches <laughs> you have to worry about. <laughs> well, as long as there are cockroaches, there will be mice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Wonderful. Right. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Close that one down. Uh, and this is uh, Eviction by Matt Lewis. I'm Matt Lewis, and this is Eviction. A husband and wife meet outside. It's almost like a Western standoff. They thank each other for agreeing to meet, and are glad that neither has been copied by the alien invaders. One suggests embracing, and the other agrees. Yes, I find this idea pleasing, due to the love I hold for you in my innards. They both turn into aliens and try and grab the other. 
They report another embarrassing failure to the mothership. The alien's plan is to non-violently relocate humans, but the leader is frustrated. How are the humans seen through their disguises? Their skins are genetically perfect, and the brain, he points to a rather dodgy looking brain pop behind him, has scanned their minds from orbit. How? He cuts to several panels of obvious aliens being viciously killed by humans. The human's reaction is usually along the lines of, oh for God's sake, and then off in the squishy aliens. For instance, hello darling, it is I, Jane Jones, your loving spouse of 15 cycles on this planet. Or, mother, I wish to feed and require your mammary glands for this purpose. Come closer. The last panel is a man reading a newspaper in a park with various aliens being killed behind him. The headline reads, is this galactic history's stupidest invasion? He cuts back to the ship. How, demands the leader. It's a mystery, says the scientist. The leader is at a loss. We need this area's soil. It's like they don't want to be peacefully re relocated to Paradise Planet 14. We could just ask them, says the scientist. Don't be ridiculous, the leader says. You know what humans are like. True, says the scientist. The leader sighs. We'll have to go with your plan. We're losing too many people. Really, says the scientist. I can press the button. You can. The scientist presses the button. The newspaper reading human sees a ship appear above and the door opens. Oh, what are those silly aliens doing now? Then his head from the top lip up is ripped off. Thousands of genetically engineered monsters pour out of the ship and start horrifically and mercilessly slaughtering all the now terrified humans. In the park, limbs are flying, bowels are ripped open, faces are torn off. The last panel is the grinning scientist. <laughs> all right. <laughs> So that was uh, Matt Lewis. Uh, we'll start off with Ram on this one. What, what, what are your feelings? I mean, I think it has, uh, I'll go with the positives first. I think it has a lot of shock value and interesting things happening, aliens invading, and uh, it's, it's interesting commentary on what human beings recognize as human. Um, and so I think all of that stuff is good. Um, but I don't think it's framed very well for me. Um, there's no one I care about. So there's no one that I look at and go like, oh, I want to know what happens to this person. Um, partly because I don't think the story is centered around any one person in particular. Um, and there also seem to be, seem to be choices that are, that are made on a whim by some of the characters, like where, where he says, okay, we do need to use your way, I suppose. And, and, we, we don't really see the justification for why that change of mind happened at that point. So it's a, it's an interesting vignette probably has cool, interesting visuals, but uh, I'm not sure there's a narrative for me to follow that I would care about. Okay. Thank you. Um, Oliver. Sorry, I have to keep on muting my mic yes. in the office. Um, uh, yeah, I think, it is quite broad. Um, I do like the fact that the pitch had dialogue in it, if you know what I mean. Like, it gives an idea of his uh, writing voice. Um, but I have to say, I, I just didn't, I didn't, didn't particularly find it enough of a, uh, in, in, enough to grab me uh, as, a, as a standout story. Um, and the ending is... Um, I'm trying, to be more, I'm trying to be more positive. I'm sorry about this. Um, it just it just didn't work for me as something to latch on to. Um, but I have to agree that it would have a lot of great visual uh, things for, for an artist to draw. Mm. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe this would be something that would be expanded uh, rather than try to fit in such a short space because it does kind of zip around between numerous points. I, I, I like that uh, it was clearly riffing off Invasion of the Body Snatchers with the whole uh, yeah, awkward yeah. dialogue between them. <laughs> Ma Maura, what's your feelings? Uh, well, yeah, I think I'm pretty much echoing what everyone said. The main thing is there's no central character that we're following in the story. Uh, are we, are, if there is, it's sort of going to be the aliens who are going to kill all humans which is what we are, you know? So um, that's fine because we've all seen Mars attacks. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's this, there's this, this sort of thing can work, but 
Um, like for for example, the very first thing he was describing, like I didn't even know where it was set. So in my mind, it was this blank space with two people doing things. So like when you throw that at a person, you're just running to catch up at your brain to like because like it's like I'm in some sort of VR green screen with two characters and. I don't know what's happening, you know? So when you pitch, the first thing should be to get very concrete details about like what's happening. And especially for a four page or it is probably better to have one character or two characters, whatever that we are following through. Um, So if there was one person who was uh, constantly being engaged to deal with these stupid invasions, there's loads of visual stuff, which is great. I'm a great fan of mass <laughs> mass violence at times, as long as it's in a <laughs> safely contained comic book, not just at take home. That, take that <laughs> snippet out of context and save it yeah, for later. Yeah, exactly. Let's just <laughs> use that everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is the great thing about the, about our fantasy lives, you know. But uh, so there, so there are elements I like here, and also this idea that. Um, the thing that I really liked is they couldn't understand why humans could, kept seeing through there. And actually, that's what I find interesting. And I would wish they would push that rather than go to the, well, we'll just kill them all because that's all they understand. So that kind of, I lost interest then, you know. Um, and also you're kind of discarding all the stuff you've set up, which I wanted to see that resolved, you know. Um, and that could be done in a very tidy, like I really love this idea of these constant attacks and the humans going, oh, you know, rolling their eyes, you know, I actually liked that part. And then I just found it slightly less interesting when it went into the guys on the ship. But mm-hmm. I definitely think there's something here and he should work on it. Yeah, I almost think that just focusing on the stuff that happens inside the ship might might yeah. lead to a much stronger narrative. Like. Let's let's see a little bit more about the the scientist who is who con- who's constantly frustrated that they keep trying nonviolent solutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, just just I guess the first question I always ask when I'm when I'm looking at any story, whether my own or someone else's, is like, why do I care? Uh, and 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 I think that's a, that's an important question to to answer right off the bat. I mean, yeah, you you could almost structure a story like that around that scientist. So you know, yeah, the, 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 exactly. he he knows deep down that um, you need to shoot humans to get them to do anything. But uh, this, this yeah, he's constantly it. frustrated yeah. scientist that nobody else will listen to. He's like, no, no, you definitely need to kill them. Yeah. Or you can. Oh, sorry, oh, go sorry, on. No, no, Oliver. I was just gonna say, it, like Maura was saying, it opens on the couple who you don't know of them. But ends on the scientist, uh, and, and as we're saying, like the scientist is the through line. Uh, if it had opened on the scientist, um, and and then just followed that point of view character, it could it could solve many problems. Um, giving a someone you care about, or at least want to know about um, their motivations and why they're why, why they're doing this, making that the focus. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it also it also would give it that nice ironic twist that actually the the, the solution is, in this case is violence because humans are uh, are involved <laughs> because humans are being humans again. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so next up is uh, the pitch from Morgan uh, Pielli. In Rio de Janeiro, all they ever do is dance by Morgan Pielli. Tech CEO Paul Radom is alone in his office when a man-sized centipede creature drops down from the ceiling. Paul screams for help as it pushes a pair of antennae-like tendrils into his mouth. As soon as the tendrils withdraw, the creature collapses, writhing in pain. Before it dies, it croaks the name Ashley Brandt. It then liquefies and evaporates, leaving Paul alone when his assistant bashes open the door. When Paul returns home, he finds a postcard with no return address in his mail. It shows a man in a white suit and Panama hat dancing at a beachside bar with the words greetings from Rio de Janeiro written across the top. Paul's interrupted by the police who've arrived to take a statement. Their interest is piqued at the mention of Ashley Brandt. She was a mob informant who recently slipped out of witness protection and disappeared. One thing that puzzled them was a press clipping of Paul she'd left on her desk. 
When Paul tries to figure out how Ashley Brandt fits into what's happening, he begins having dreams about the dancing man in the white suit. The dreams plague Paul. He wanders the streets unable to sleep, seeing the men wherever he goes. Paul begins feeling unwell, subjected to strange convulsions and the sensation of crawling skin. One night, Paul comes across the man from the postcard. Dressed differently, Paul's certain that this time he's real. Paul follows him back to his home. We see from Paul's point of view as he slips into the man's house, chases him upstairs, and tries to demand answers. But instead of words, all that comes out of Paul's mouth is a horrifying shriek. Paul turns to catch a glimpse of himself in the reflection of a window, only to see a centipede creature staring back. He inserts his newly formed tendrils into the man's mouth, unable to stop himself. Horrified by what he's become, Paul crashes through the window of the house and onto the street below. His body convulses, then liquefies and evaporates. All that remains is the crumpled postcard. A pair of feet appear beside the postcard and a man picks it up. It's Paul's assistant. He tells the now-dead Paul that the hit was nothing personal. He marvels at how the assassin virus, that turns each target into the next target's killer, is so much more elegant than a simple bullet. Excellent. So um, we'll start with uh, Oliver this time. What do you think of uh, of Morgan's pitch? I like that one. That, that was, I, I think the pitch itself was well put together. Um, certainly gives you a, a good sense of the story and very clear uh, character to follow through. It goes a bit mad at the end, which is great, which is exactly what you want. Um, the, 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 it turns into... Uh, turns into a, a, a bug and then you realize it's actually uh, an assassin's virus that's making him doing that uh, and then th there's a bit of fuzziness in terms of um, passing it on to the next person but I, I think this is a good a good start uh, to, to an idea of a, a story mm. uh, I, I, I like to think of this one as Franz Kafka's human target oh, yeah yeah um, I mean, it's <laughs> It's very sort of, um, there's no, uh, I mean, not that it has to be, but there's no sort of humour or lightness to it. It starts off with mysterious, more of a mystery kind of uh, trying to figure out what is going on. Uh, but yeah, I like that. Maura, well, you, your thoughts? Um, yeah, I think this is a very interesting concept. It's one of these that's, uh, I think Oliver said, uh, if you've got a mystery in a story, uh, your audience immediately wants to solve it. That's like a classic great thing, you know? So it's, and I also love the bizarreness of the opening, you know, where, you know, caterpillar, to, sorry, centipede creature just plops down. Um, I think it would be not impossible, but hard to get this into four pages. That would be one of the things I would think a lot about. So there's a kind of a time passage happening at certain points later on. Um, and that's going to be very difficult to pull off in four pages. So I, I'm thinking they're going to, for this to work, it's going to have to be even compressed, even more compressed. And I don't know, I, I that is my actual main issue with this is that I think to get this in four pages is not is going to be very tricky. Um, so, some things need to be simplified. I actually really love the title, by the way, because I'm a fan of strange titles. But then when I was thinking about it, I'm not sure it's actually really um, uh, plugging into Connected. what's yeah. yeah what's actually going on, even though I really like the title. <laughs> so I'm not sure about that, actually, in retrospect. But yeah, really strong idea. I love um, this kind of thought experiment where oh, what if there was a thing like an assassin virus and then applying it to the story so i i think if you wanted to compress you would have to really think about the mechanics of this thing how exactly it works and 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 how quickly it takes hold those sorts of things and then how can i get the story to work within those four pages that's going to be the hardest task here but very good ram your thoughts yeah, yeah, I'd have to agree with uh, with with uh, what Maura said in that. I think it's nearly near impossible to fit this in in, in four pages. Um, frankly, I think the first three paragraphs are right until the point where uh, Paul comes across the man from the postcard. I think that is three pages, and then the rest of it is another four pages. Mm. Uh, so this is probably like a seven or eight page comic that I'm looking at. Um, 
and I think they're all necessary. I think the the beats, the strangeness of the beginning, being a little bit slowed down and finding clues, I think that's all necessary. So I, I don't see that you would preserve the... Uh, I actually really like the title and I would totally keep it because... Yeah. I, I, because that opening chunk is so non sequitur that, that I love it. Um, and the, the other sort of problem I have with this is, is that the, the essence of a mystery is at the end, the reader should go like, oh, I could have solved it. It was all in front of me right at the beginning. Yeah. Um, whereas that's not the case here. I feel like the, the assassin virus almost comes in as a, as a uh, deus ex uh, explanation at the end as to what's going on. Um, whereas if I were to, if I were to fix this, um, I would, I would start thinking about, okay, how do I seed in the idea of the assassin virus right on page one? So that by the time we get to the end, the readers feel like, Oh, that's what it was. And that, that realization, that reward of trying to solve the mystery is there. Um, but yeah, strong concept. Um, I don't, I, I'm not quite sure it can be executed in four pages. Yeah, I'd really agree with all Ram said there. I think, uh, to be honest, I'd love to read this as an eight or a 10 pager. Yeah. Um, I think cause it's strong enough. It's like, and that's, that's a real gift to have that. Um, yeah, there's lots so, of aesthetic style panache, yeah. the postcard, the man in the suit dancing. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is one of those things that um, sometimes, uh, uh, and, and perhaps we're to blame for this uh, about the way we talk about Future Shocks, is, is, is that it can be sometimes that kind of notion of the twist ending yeah. can override everything else. You think, well, I just need to have a twist ending. Yeah. And, yeah. and so often um, with the, the, the Thor Bubble um, pitch fests, uh, the ending comes out of nowhere. Yeah. yeah. You go, well, that's not a twist. It, yeah, it's only a twist if it was there all along. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. And that seeds it at the start with the centipede dropping down. So there is that link, but maybe it should have been connected to what the tech CEO is doing uh, rather than an assassin uh, taking him out after taking out Ashley. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like the assassin bit is the, is the bit that I was like, oh, what? Where did that come from? You yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's like Agatha Christie used to do this sometimes, where she would withhold information from the audience and then produce it at the end, and you'd be like, "What?" <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. and 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 people can get annoyed by that. Uh, that's the other thing. So you don't want your audience angry at you. <laughs> also, if you if you're doing that, you must have sufficient skill to obfuscate the fact that you did yes. it and that yeah. you cheated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So next up, we have uh, Patrick Draper. Patrick Draper, The X-Files. Anthony Sargent is very excited and is on his way to give his girlfriend, Lindsay McAllister, some news. Anthony is a conspiracy theorist and has spent the last five years investigating the notions that aliens are amongst us, hiding in human form, planning an invasion. Lindsay, his girlfriend of three weeks, is happy enough to put up with this. Anthony has got some hard evidence now though, drone footage, taken by him of a compound full of alien creatures here in the UK. Lindsay's curiosity is piqued, and she asked to see it before he did anything else with it. He meets her in a bar, and she puts the memory stick into a laptop. It is, to be fair, pretty compelling. She hands him the memory stick back, and Anthony takes it to the local newspaper. When they put the memory stick in, all that's on it is a montage of internet cat videos. His jaw drops. She's still at the bar waiting for him when he gets back. I'm sorry, Anthony, she says. I had to. She hands him a drink and he takes a swig. You were right all along, Lindsay tells him. Aliens have been hiding amongst us for years and they're planning an invasion. Many of them are dormant, unaware that they're not human, a secret army of sleepers to be woken up when the time is right. My job is to catch and contain them. That drink you just finished contains a chemical which blocks the cloaking ability and fixes you in your true form. Anthony looks down at his tentacle, wrapped around his glass. He drops it horrified as he catches his changing reflection in the mirror. The other customers in the bar are revealed to be undercover agents who bundle him out the back. Sorry, Anthony, Lindsay says truthfully. It's not me, it's you. She picks up the phone and calls her boss. He was my last one. It felt personal. I'm done. 
The voice on the other end of the line says, sorry, Lindsay, you're way too good at this for us to let you go just like that. And you know that you know way too much. I think you're going to be working for us for a lot longer yet. Lindsay smiles. Right you are, she says, before she presses a manicured tentacle onto the end call button. All right. Uh, some interesting uh, mixed genres in there. Um, uh, Ram, let's go, let's go to you first on this one. Yeah, very conflicted on this one. Uh, there are things that I that I quite like about it. Um, I really like the fact that that it twists the idea of of aha, I'm actually an alien and I stopped you from doing this. Where it turns out, like no, aha, you are actually an alien and you don't know it. Um, I quite like that. I think that works as a, a really well as a twist ending. Um, but then I feel I don't see why the rest of it is necessary beyond that point. Uh, I don't see what we achieve with the the she's also an alien with a tentacle manicured nail. So I think that might be a bit superfluous at that point. Um, and structurally, um, I think the, the thing that sticks out to me on the positive is that, yes, we immediately care, you know, there's a relationship, there's a, there's a conspiracy theorist. It's a, it's a familiar trope that we all know. And we're like, okay, okay. I know what this is. Uh, and I know why I should care about him, you know, trying to justify himself. I'm not crazy. Look at this. Mm. Um, so that's great. But then most of the story happens in retrospect where she is explaining to him the, me the mechanism of the plot. Uh, and I always find that kind of really loses people uh, along the way where we saw something happen, which wasn't very exciting. But it's only exciting because someone's explaining to you why it should be exciting. Um, so I'm not sure I'm a, I'm a fan of how that unfolds. So it's good. It works uh, in, in, in all the ways that you would expect a story to work. But um, yeah, I, I just think there are a couple of things uh, with it. I would try to, I mean, it's comics. You don't need two people sitting at a table talking. Uh, I would maybe try to layer her narrative explanation over the actual events happening. Uh, and that way there's some visual drama going on there mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Moira, what are, you, what are you? Yeah, thinking? yeah. I was just going to say the Talking Heads. I can see the artist crying right now. Yeah. <laughs> so because hey, we need Talking Heads sometimes. So don't get me wrong. It's, I think that's another trope that's almost irritating as well. It's like uh, so it's all about balance. Um, so you need to. There just isn't enough action or interest. Uh, going on here I think I do like the I do like some of the turns in it but uh, it's just uh, just needs a bit more thought and a bit more like how can I make this engaging to the reader in the in like what's at risk here you know uh, is it is it really just emotional risk? You know, I mean, it's, it's, there's, and this, I know this is, again, sounds like a tropey thing to say. What are the stakes uh, involved? They're, they're, the, it, it's, it comes across as an interesting story, but not, uh, not very, very engaging. But I think there's elements here and it could work. And I, I like Ram's idea of having the dialogue over action, which is a really brilliant way of, uh, you know, uh, one we use all the time to uh, get information and keep the engagement at the same time. That could work. Oliver. Yeah, I almost feel like it's following the wrong person and it should be following Lindsay. And that would be because the, the, end, the end reveal being that she is, she is an alien too. So it, it would be a case of beginning with her and slowly revealing that she is behind the footage that that uh, that, that, that Anthony captures. Uh, she is behind uh, swapping out the the footage on the USB drive. How does she go about that? Um, and, and, and revealing those, those steps uh, rather than being the talking heads. Actually, I did this previously. Um, but yeah, it, it does hit all the the points of what a future should be, slowly revealing more and more. But it should be more active in how it how it does that, rather than in retrospect. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, th I think making it Lindsay's story would be 
So. Yeah, and I have to agree with Morris' point. Like somebody needs to be in some kind of danger at some point. Um, it's all very, it's all very civil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Super, thank you. Well, uh, we're on to our last uh, contestant now, and that is uh, Zach Moore. Hello, my name is Zach Moore, and this is my story, A Circulation Problem. A dead sea monster washes ashore on a beach in a port town in England. Our protagonist is one Roderick Burcham, a local marine biologist hired on by a secretive government agency to research the creature at their seaside facility. Coming in that night for his first look and dissection of the creature, Burcham meets a scientist who looks frightened upon seeing him. When Burcham asks him what's wrong, the scientist simply says that Burcham looks oddly familiar and then leaves him to it. Dissecting the monster, Burcham notes that the creature is quite unlike other local sea life and appears to be closer to some form of aquatic mammal rather than a fish, Bertram recalls with horror a news story from weeks ago about space debris falling into the ocean near the town and how a team of government agents had been sent to scoop any materials they found floating near the surface. They had claimed that they had found nothing. Bertram is struggling to understand how the thing could have been alive to begin with, and its internal organs seem stretched, disordered, or useless when he discovers something strange. Some kind of metal object is lodged inside the creature's heart, yet there is no entry wound. Strangest of all, Bertram discovers that when he touches the sides of the object in a certain order, they begin to glow with a bright light and emit a humming noise. The brightness gradually increases to wash out everything else in Bertram's sight, and the humming becomes deafening. Suddenly, the bright light disappears, and he finds himself surrounded by scientists who stare at him in shock. The creature has vanished from the operating table, and instead they are all crowded around the strange metal device. Bertram realizes that he has been hideously transformed, as though his form was stretched to the proportions of another being, and he feels a sharp pain in his heart. The metal device has somehow forced itself inside of him. Trying to run away towards an exit, Bertram accidentally crashes through a window at the edge of the building, thereby throwing himself into the sea outside. Bertram, now a dead, deformed creature, realizes that the device inside of him is a time machine and he washes up dead on the shore uh, so we'll, we'll start with uh, Oliver on this one what are your thoughts on uh, on Zach's story well I think it unfortunately breaks the main combination of time travel stories which is you're not supposed to meet yourself and then cause a paradox which blows up the universe um, I, I, I mean I mean being slightly silly but also serious um, I, I think that as a story uh, structure, it's great. Uh, begin and uh, circular situation, fantastic. But really, the time travel thing just doesn't quite fit. Um, there's also the sort of the vagueness about him turning into the the, the deformed creature. Uh, it, it's the, um, the the I'm just going through it now. The uh, the, the the metal. Uh, objects that transforms him but doesn't really explain what's going on is that a side effect of time travel um what what is it that's happening exactly uh i would probably suggest taking out the time travel element and making it a thing that transforms people and he's investigating that um but then that does take away the whole point of the of the future shock as such um I, I just think there needed to be more, and maybe that would come through in the scripts, more about the actual exploration of this uh, creature that washed up on shore and why, just what happened? At what point did this time travel element insert itself? Because it doesn't seem to insert itself in the story. It's a, it's a completely um, closed loop of a time travel bit if that makes sense uh, Ram what, what's, what's your thoughts on this one yeah I mean I, I, I agree um, with Oliver in that the, the time travel thing actually works against the story uh, in, in a lot of ways also because we establish it and then we confirm it and there's nothing that happens in between I mean, clearly we establish it when He's like, oh, I, I've seen you before. You're oddly familiar. And you're already thinking, okay, the creature is actually the guy. Uh, because we've, we've all experienced time travel stories before. And then right at the end, the big reveal is that, oh, yeah, the metal object is the time travel thing. And it doesn't really feel like as big a reveal because 
you are already expecting it right from the beginning, uh, at least for me. Um, the other thing, which I think is a, is a major issue with the story is while it's structurally there and, and it works, I love the cleverness of the title and the structure of the story. Um, I don't care. Like, why do I care about any of these characters? Why do I care? Like some sort of personal reflection on who this character is uh, and having that tie into the story would have made it infinitely more interesting. Um, you know, as we've seen with some of the other submissions, even if the stories are flawed, there's a reason for you to follow a person uh, or a character. Um, and I just don't think that reason exists here. Um, and I think perhaps less ambition on the time travel side and more time spent developing a character uh, to an interesting POV would have been, would have served the story well. Maura, what's your final thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, both Oliver and Ram put it really well. It, uh, and I think we need to maybe just uh, drill into that thing that character is very important. I mean, settings, uh, concept are, are great and uh, they engage your mind. But you really do need to think about why, uh, you know, why do you care about these people? Uh, so like... I was thinking about the opening scene is there's a lot of fuzziness. Uh, there's a secret government agency. There's another scientist who isn't named. There's where are they looking? Why are they there? Who are they working for? I was just like, hang on, I'm already losing uh, the concrete details of why, what, when, you know, the, those, those things. And so it's, it's more it's more focused on the the conceit of the story so uh focus instead on the people in the story and why they are doing things um and then it'll come through i think because there's some you know some nice stuff here but uh, I think the other point that ram made which is good to know is is to just think about most people have read so much stuff most children have consumed millions of hours of narrative. Humans are very clever at narrative. So yeah, right at the beginning, you see a big monster. Someone says you look familiar. Your mind is already leaping in certain directions. So uh, you either have to subvert that or you don't signal it as much as that. So. Okay, great. So um, <clears throat> now that we've gone through... Just to, of, just to oh, sorry. Add, add to that a little bit, I think a thing that is very useful to remember is you could be writing high fantasy, science fiction, weird fiction, any of those things. But a story that you're writing for other human beings to consume only matters if it's on some level fundamentally about what it's like to be a human being. Yes. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people tend to miss that because they get very enamored with the idea that they're working with. Um, but stories are not ideas. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, 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 the future shocks are just one of those formats that throw up uh, because it, 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 it's so compressed. It puts so much strain on all the elements of, of narrative and, and character and, and, and just the, the whole idea of a story that uh, weaknesses get exposed very easily. Yeah. You know, yeah. flaws flaws in the storyline, flaws in the idea. Um, you you see them very obviously, and, and it's it's one of the advantages of doing this competition is is that um, it's there right in front of you. You know, yeah. um, uh, and fair play to everyone who's yeah. uh, who's uh, pitched uh, for this competition this year, and congratulations to the five people: um, Honor, Matt, Morgan, Patrick, and Zach, who have uh, have got through this year because it's it's not easy. Um, no, no. It's not easy to do the story. Never mind, put yourself out there and uh, be put on the internet for uh, for everyone to uh, to judge you. So um, we're now going to choose. Well, I'm not going to choose. Uh, our three judges are going to choose uh, the one that they think will be uh, the winner. The prize is paid work with 2000 AD. You will work with uh, Thag the Mighty to bring this uh, pitch to fruition and it will be published in a future issue of 2000 AD for which you will be paid. Um, and uh, so uh, without much further ado, we're going to go away for a second, find out who the judges uh, think should win and we'll come straight back with the name of the winner of this year's Writer Talent Search.
so the judges have deliberated and the result is unanimous verdict. And the winner, insert drum roll, is Anna Vincent. Uh, our first contestant for this year's panel. Congratulations, Honor. You will work with Tag the Mighty to make your story a, uh, a reality for two, the pages of 2000 AD. So thank you to her and to, to, to all of the contestants this year. Like I said, it, it, it's, it's not an easy process yeah. putting yourself out there. I mean, uh, 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 guys, you know, do, do you have a message for, for not just our finalists, but for everyone who, who pitched this year? Yeah, keep writing. Keep writing, keep uh, refining your work, meet artists. Um, work with artists if you can make comics. Yeah, you don't need actually a publisher to start making comics. Do what you can, uh, even if it's like little stick figures. And uh, but yeah, it's and 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 read a lot of comics. That's the other thing across lots of genres of comics, not just science fiction or fantasy. Re- read biographical comics. Um, you know, read old comics, like really old comics. Uh, it, it's really it's really great to strengthen the mind about how the the form works with story. Ram, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, congrats, congrats to uh, Honor Vincent, Rachel Honor Vincent, um, on 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 winning. Uh, but yeah, I, I certainly have you know words of encouragement for Morgan Pielli, who who wrote the uh, Assassin's Virus thing. Um, it was very good, very ambitious. Uh, probably not fit to format, but um, still, you know, well done. And then to, to everyone else, I would say, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you're all trying to do the right things. Uh, you're all reaching for the right things, but potentially read more, analyze more why certain things work. Um, and uh, I guess the most important piece of advice would be it's very easy to be become enamored that you've got a cool idea, but stories are not about the idea they're about how you execute the idea um and so so focusing on that would be great oliver yeah i, I can't stress enough what more just said um uh, so i emphasize it as saying writers should get into a habit of drawing out their scripts even if you're literally just drawing a grid of panels uh you don't have to draw the characters or anything just have the, the grid of how you imagine the page to look, and it will help you so much in terms of dividing your story up into four or 22 pages. Um, and it'll help your story structure, and it will help uh, just just the getting your brain to, to figure out the, the how to fit it all in or not, and realise that you're, you've got too much. Uh, uh, echoing Ram saying, Morgan Paley, great, great pitch, just was a little bit too much. And I do believe that if you'd have just, you know, quickly drawn it on a piece of paper, uh, you'd have gone, oh yeah, this is this is a ten pager. Um, just just stop when uh, you've come to the end of four pages. <laughs> just <laughs> the thing that is really cool about what you're doing uh, and why this is important is often you'll find writers who have good ideas but don't have the ability to go, hey, artist, come draw this thing because. Yeah. Artists also need to look at, okay, who do I work with that's going to further my career? Is it some completely unheard of new person or this other person who already has a career and a readership? And so using 2080 and Rebellion's sort of draw and pull to say, look, we can get these cool artists to work on these stories because we believe in these stories. I think that is like an incredibly positive and useful thing. Yeah, Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you, all three of you, for uh, for, for judging that one. As always, uh, you know, a great year of entries, and uh, it's not easy to sit yeah. through them and uh, and choose your favourite. But uh, thank you very much indeed for your service on this one. Um, and we shall be back in a year's time. You know what? Probably online because this works quite well, um, mm-hmm. and it means I don't have to stand up in front of an audience of people. I can edit it <laughs> afterwards, which is always fun. But. Um, for one final time, congratulations to to, to Anna and yes. uh, and to all the finalists uh, for this year, and thank you to the uh, more than one hundred people who uh, who pitched. Um, and for those of you who are at Thought Bubble, we hate you and we're very jealous, but uh, have uh, a wonderful time. And that's uh, all from me and all from the judges. Take care.